Good evening. If you would, take your Bible and turn to Zechariah chapter number 7. For the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at Zechariah chapter 7 and chapter 8 as we're going through this wonderful book that deals so much with Israel, the city of Jerusalem, the person of Jesus Christ. If you remember, and just to kind of put us exactly where we're at in the book, in Zechariah chapter 1 through 6, God had granted to Zechariah a vision a number of visions in one single night. There were a total of eight visions in one night. And what God was really doing in those visions was revealing the plan and the purpose for the children of Israel. That a lot with the city of Jerusalem. He talks. He talked about how that he was going to be in the midst of them, how that he was going to be an encouragement to them. He was going to be a wall of fire around them, how that they would be blessed. And so much of those eight visions dealt with the future millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ because so many of the prophecies have not come to fruition yet. Now, some of them were without question contemporary for Zachariah's day, but when you look at the overall uh, context and you look at the overall teaching that we dealt with through those night visions, without question, God was showing him something that would take place when the Messiah, the promised Messiah, the Christ would rule and reign here on earth. So in the first uh, six chapters, God gives to Zechariah the series of visions in one night, revealing the plan and the purpose that's to come for the children of Israel. And then in Zechariah chapter 9 through 14, there are wonderful prophecies given about the coming Messiah or our Lord Jesus Christ and more of God's plan surrounding Christ's second coming. I love studying chapters 9 through 14 because it tells us so much of even the first coming of Christ as well as looking into the second coming. And I'm looking forward to getting into that in the next few weeks. But in between the opening of Zechariah 1 through 6 and the ending prophecies of Zechariah 9 through 14 are chapters 7 and 8, which deal really with a historical interlude uh, between these two sections. Two years have passed since Zechariah's eight-night vision. So you can imagine at the end of chapter number 6, just fast forward about two years, and now... Uh, many Bible scholars believe the temple has been already completed. Some believe it's about to be completed. I believe the temple most likely has been completed at this point in time. And during that time, not only has the temple been, uh, been rebuilt, but you're beginning to see the population in Jerusalem and in some of the sound, uh, surrounding areas uh, begin to be repopulated. So things are starting to move. They don't have the wall built yet. That, not, that will not come until Nehemiah a number of years later. But you're looking at two years after Zechariah 6, and now you're looking at the temple being rebuilt. So they're, they're in there, they're worshiping, they're offering sacrifices. And you also see uh, a population of people beginning to come back from exile, from Babylon, back in uh, to the Palestinian area and Jerusalem, the surrounding areas. Two years, uh, I'm sorry, Zechariah begins with a delegation uh, from the exile coming to Jerusalem. So... One of the things, whenever you open up chapter number seven, you begin to read about a delegation that is, is coming and coming literally from Bethel, and they're, they're coming to Jerusalem for two reasons. Number one, they came to pray before the Lord in the temple. Uh, and boy, when I think about that, I, my mind and my heart just went to where you and I are at in our life today and how important prayer is. You know, prayer is really you and I communicating with God. It's us having a conversation with God about all of the things that are going on in our life. It's about us seeking Him, about us fellowshipping with Him. It's about us pouring our hearts out before Him and casting all of our cares upon Him. It's about us praying for other people and for God to be involved in the lives of other people and to move people closer to Him. I can't tell you how much the Scripture talks about us praying. Uh, that's not what this lesson is about, but I, I did just want to take and speak to you about it, the importance of prayer in your everyday life. Paul talks about praying always with all prayer and supplication. And the idea there is, as we wake up of a morning and we begin a conversation with God in our heart, we may set aside a time where we read our Bibles and have a devotion and we, we begin to communicate with God from our heart about our day and about our loved ones. But all throughout that day, we're praying. We're just, we're shooting prayers up to God continually. And I want to encourage you to, it, to, to just simply begin your day with a conversation with God and have that all the day through. 
It is an awareness of God in your life about every detail of your life. I'm aware of the presence of God in my life, about my attitudes, about my actions, about my words, about uh, a sin. If I commit a sin, I'm keeping a short account with God and I'm confessing it. And so I encourage you, go before the Lord in prayer. Begin your day and end your day talking to the Lord. So they came, this delegation came really to pray before the Lord. And then they also came to ask a question regarding fasts. And you see that in chapter number three, which we'll get to in a minute. The question is asked, should I weep and fast in the fifth month as I have done for so many years? So this group has come. They have spent 70 years praying, fasting, uh, taking one day and abstaining from any food to focus on God and to focus on whatever spiritual aspect of their life, of bringing God into the, into the middle of a circumstance and situation. They are so burdened about an earthly situation that they are seeking God and they just abstain from any food. And for 70 years, the children of Israel had been observing a special day of fasting. There were literally specific days that had been assigned for abstaining from food. So you could imagine they have just seen the destruction of their temple in 586 BC, 605 BC. They saw Babylon uh, come down and Nebuchadnezzar and, and he ransacked the city, and he took people like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Ezekiel. He carried them captive over to Babylon. And then later on in 586 BC, he came in and destroyed the walls of the city, killed a large population of the city, took the rest of them captive. Those that remained ended up going down into Egypt. He destroyed the temple at that time and carried away all of the vessels of the, the temple that Solomon had built. Uh, those beautiful golden vessels, he carried them back to Babylon. And oh, the anguish and the heartache that the nation of Israel and the Jewish people had as they hung their harps upon the willows and they could no longer sing the songs of Zion, as the psalmist reminds us. How can we sing the songs of Zion in a strange land? Well, that led them to pray and to fast for Israel, for their people, for their city, uh, where God's name was, to repent and to turn to God. As a matter of fact, the Jewish people have never struggled with idolatry since their captivity of 70 years in Babylon. They've struggled with other things, and obviously they've rejected the Messiah, but as far as idolatry and the worship of other gods, they have never struggled with that since then. The Day of Atonement was the only day in which God had required a fast in the law of Moses. And, of course, they abstained from food as they remembered uh, and repented of their sin. And they also were looking forward to their Savior coming and atoning for their sin. So one day on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, they would go and they would not eat any food that day. They would, uh, they would fast. And the implication that's given in this section of Scripture in Zechariah chapter number really 1 through 6, the implication is the fast had become a burden. It brings before us the question of repetitive repetitive religious activities. You know, tradition and ritual is not a bad thing, but boy, it can become a very bad thing. It can become routine. Uh, it can become traditionalism. Uh, it can become a burden. And Zechariah in this section of Scripture begins to real, reveal their heart that their fasts were not coming from their heart, but rather their fasts were just something that a box they were checking off. And it is really a powerful thought for you and for me. When you study Zechariah 7 and 8, you will find there were actually four days during the year they set aside a day to fast during the captivity, the fourth, the fifth, the seventh, and the tenth month. And each of those months, they had a day that they would set aside to fast. And Zechariah detects that they had been doing this out of tradition or form, ritual, not from the heart. Tradition simply means that which is passed on. Important that we pass on certain traditions. So what is a tradition? Well, it's just something we pass on. Boy, there are things that the Scripture tells us to pass on. For instance, in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 2, the Scripture says, And the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. In other words, he's saying truth, doctrine, biblical truth, biblical doctrine. You're to take that and you're to pass it down to faithful men 
who will turn and pass it on to other people and it will just continue on in line. And that's exactly what Christ did with the disciples and with Paul. That's what Paul did with Timothy. And that's what the disciples did. Peter did it with Mark. And, and listen, they just kept turning. And all throughout the years, John did it uh, with disciples uh, that, that we even read about today. And so, Irenaeus and different people. But think about it just for a minute. Nothing wrong with the tradition. We're instructed to pass on biblical truth. We've been passed on most of us the importance of attending God's house. The Bible says not forsaking the assembly yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. In other words, we understand the importance because many of us, our, our family, our moms, our dads, our grandparents taught us the importance of going to God's house and setting aside a time to worship God and to praise God. A daily devotion, what I mentioned earlier, just spending time in the Bible and spending time in prayer. And so there are traditions, if you want to call them rituals, there are religious activities, repetitive, to where we go into the house of God and we lift up our voice in prayer. We go to Sunday school, we do different things, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with those as long as they're done from the heart. Nothing at all wrong with tradition or form in and of itself. The problem is when it lacks heart, when it is not from the heart as unto the Lord, when it is just done to be done. Whenever I was typing this up, my mind went to a dear friend of mine. Matter of fact, two friends of mine in the last year and a half, and they've come to me and they said, you know, my quiet times are terrible. I'm reading through the Bible. And I'm just, I'm just doing it to do it. That's what I'm talking about. Well, why am I going to church? Well, I'm just going to church to go to church. I'm just uh, doing this to do that. No, no, no. In other words, they said, how do I get out of that? How? Because it's just my quiet times are just dead and I don't have any fellowship with the Lord. I said, well, be honest. Get it back into the heart, from the heart. Tell the Lord, say, Lord, I, I want to I wanna fellowship with you. I want to know you. I want, I want you to speak to me out of your word. And, and God, I want, I, I want to, to be used by you. And so, Lord... Just do it from the heart. And as you go into that Bible study time, as you go to church, you're going to church not just to go to church, just to be doing something, but you're going and saying, God, I'm coming today to worship you, to love you, to honor you, to learn something, some biblical truth from your word that will help me to know you and to worship you that will help me to live a better Christian life, maybe a truth to share with someone else. The Bible goes forth, it's either bread for the eater, it feeds us, or it's seed for the sower, it's seed for us to sow into someone else's life. And so what happens is when we're not pursuing God and we're pursuing a religious activity, when we're not, when our heart is not actually after God and that from, from, from the heart worshiping Him, it becomes traditionalism. And that's when form degenerates into formalism, tradition into traditionalism, and it begins to take authority literally over God's Word. Listen, it, it begins to take an authority over our lives that it, that it shouldn't have. God's Word has the authority over our life, and, and God has that authority. Notice, traditionalism becomes a jail instead of a guide assisting us in worship. I love that. So in Zechariah 7, 5, this is what is said, and I, I love this. He says, Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those seventy years, did you at all fast unto me, even to me? So these guys come and they say, Well, should we be fasting? And uh, like we've done all these years, and the implication there is this is such a burden. We've been doing this for so long, and so... The Lord speaks, and he says, well, have any of those fasts been for me? Look, have you fasted to get to know me? Have, have you set aside this time to pursue me? And this verse 6, he says, and when you did eat and when you did drink, did not you eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? You know, whenever you come into the New Testament, you read the book of Corinthians, I think it's uh, in, in 1 Corinthians, he says, whether you eat, or whether you drink, and whatsoever you do, do it all for the glory of the Lord. Whether you sleep, whether you eat, whether you drink, no matter what you're doing, you're doing it out of a heart that honors and glorifies God. In other words, 
the pursuit of life is to glorify him. And he's saying right here, that wasn't the pursuit of your heart. You were doing all these things and you were just doing them to check off a box. You were doing religious activities without a real relationship from the heart with me. So Zechariah reveals their heart with really verses number five and six. And then Zechariah speaks to their history. And he does that really in the rest of the chapter. He says, thus speaks the Lord of hosts saying, execute true judgment and show mercy and compassion every man to his brother. And right here, what this is saying is, listen, treat people the right way, show mercy and compassion. You know, all of us make mistakes. All of us go through difficult times. All of us sin, if you would. But listen, whenever someone sins against you, when someone does you wrong, are you willing to be merciful to them as God's been merciful to you? Are you willing to show compassion to someone like God has shown compassion to you, every single man, and to his brother? And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. That's the foreigner in the land. And let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. In other words, don't think badly of other people. Don't always have a suspicious nature about others. Don't be thinking evil in your hearts. So often the accuser of the brethren is there putting that evil in our hearts and our minds. Rather what? Extend compassion. Extend mercy. Love. It doesn't think any evil. Notice what he says in James. He says, real religion, pure religion, and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widow in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. He said, look, show mercy and compassion. Extend forgiveness and grace. Don't think evil in your heart toward each other, but rather, listen, take care of the fatherless and the widow. Keep yourself unspotted from the world. That means separate from the world in sin. Zechariah 7, 11, it says, but they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. In other words, this is your history. Your fathers, they refuse to do what I asked them to do. Look, James says, do not just be hearers of the word, but doers also. So they heard the word, but they would not do the word. And the picture of pulling away the shoulder is when they were trying to to put a yoke on an ox, and God was trying uh, to guide them in his word. And what will a, what will a cow or ox do? They'll, they'll pull away. Uh, you ever put your hand on someone's shoulder and then pull away? That's the idea, but the idea is of an ox not wanting to be yoked and pulling away, resisting coming underneath the and submitting to the leadership of God. And they stop their ears that they should not hear. James one twenty two. I just quoted, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. They would not hearken to the word. Then he goes on in 7, 12, and he says, Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone. Listen, they hardened their hearts. They would not, they wouldn't listen to the word of God. They would not heed the word of God. They wouldn't listen to the prophets and the spirit of God. He goes on and says, Lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent in his spirit by the former prophets. God sent them preacher after preacher, prophet after prophet, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Amos. He just kept sending them, and their hearts were harder than stone. The seed of the word of God could not penetrate it. And so, therefore, came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. God is so patient with us. God is so long-suffering and so merciful. He's not rewarded us according to our sins, nor chastened us according to our iniquities. But, oh, there comes a point in time where he does. If we will not allow the Word of God to soften our hearts and allow God to do something, what's He doing? If you've been with us through any of the study of the Minor Prophets, even the book of Daniel, as we've studied the Bible on Wednesday nights and on Sundays, you know the history of the nation of Israel and how they rebelled against God and His Word, and they did it over and over and over until He sent Babylon down to chasten them in 605. Uh, Judah, and in 733, 100 plus years before that, he sent Assyria down to chasten Israel. And so, verse 13, therefore it has come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear, so they cried and I would not hear, saith the word of hope. In other words, there came a point where God kept crying, God kept screaming, God kept dealing, and they would not submit, they would not humble themselves, they turned the shoulder to the yoke of God's word. They would not be doers of the word. They hardened their heart toward God's word. He said, 
I cried and they would not hear. So now, Proverbs one twenty four says, because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, then shall they call upon me. Verse 28 says, but I will not answer. And that's exactly what Zechariah is saying here. He said, so they have cried. He said, I cried and they were not here. So now they are crying and I am not going to hear their cry. Verse 14 closes out this chapter. He says, but I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them. Listen, even right now in the book of Zechariah, two years after the rebuilding of the temple, there are Jewish people that are scattered all over the world because of them not willing to take the yoke and submit to the Word of God. They would not listen to the, to the messages of the men of God that proclaim to them the truth of Scripture. And so God gives them a view of their history. He detects what's wrong with their heart. They have become ritual and formalistic. That was the problem with the Pharisees. They cared more about the traditions of their fathers than they did what the Word of God said. Everything was ritualistic. It was not from the heart, a heartfelt relationship with God. So he takes them through their history and reminds them of how hardened their heart had become. And now, in chapter number 8, and this is for next week, Zechariah gives them hope for the future. Well, aren't you glad that if you and I will return, if we'll turn to God, if we'll repent, that he will restore, the prophet Joel says, he'll restore the years that the locust and the cankerworm have eaten. Boy, he restores those years. Whenever the prodigal son came back, oh, they killed the fatted calf. They put the, the ring on his finger, the robe on his back, and they had a great celebration. Oh, what God's looking for you and for me to do is he's looking for us to turn to him in a heartfelt, truthful repentance and ask God to help us and to forgive us and to restore that right relationship with him. Dear Lord, do it in all of our hearts. God, do it in my heart. Do it in all of our hearts so that we're not coming to church checking off a box. We're not having a prayer time just to say we had a prayer time. We're not doing a daily devotion just so that we know we're supposed to do it. We're doing it because we love you and we want to know you. We want to glorify you. We want to be used by you. We want the Holy Spirit of God to fill us and to use us. And we want to honor your name while we walk here on this earth. Heavenly Father, help us. Amen. Help us all. Next week, we'll be looking at Zechariah 8. It's one of my favorite chapters uh, in the book of Zechariah because it deals with the glorious future of the city of Jerusalem during the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want us to close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would help us. God, forgive us for not having a heartfelt, real relationship with you. Dear Lord, help us to honor and to glorify your name in all that we say and all that we do. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, help us to show mercy and compassion, not think evil in our hearts, to honor the father and the widow, widows that are around us. God, help us not to turn a shoulder, rather to hearken, to be hearers and doers of your word, to, to be genuine and sincere in our heartfelt relationship with you, to confess sin when we know it's there. Dear Lord God, help us to be willing to put and allow you to put the yoke of your word upon us because as the old songwriter says, trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Help us to trust you and obey you in all that we do. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen.